In this episode, we'll take a look at the Rode MTG5 shotgun microphone. First of all, this entire episode is recorded with the MTG5 shotgun microphone boom just out of the frame right here. And it is recording into my sound device's 888 recorder. What else can I tell you? We did not do any sort of processing, but it is loudness normalized to minus 23 LUFS. This is so you could hear pretty much what it sounds like right out of the recorder. First up, let's get you some audio samples from a variety of different microphones that are somewhat similar. Next up, some audio samples from four different microphones. First off, we have the Deity S Mic 2S short shotgun microphone. Next up, we have the Rode NTG3, then the Rode NTG5, and then the Sennheiser MKH 416. Some people will ask, well, why did you choose those particular mics? Well, there are a couple of reasons. Some people will ask, well, why did you choose those particular mics? Well, there are a couple of reasons. Some people will ask, well, why did you choose those particular mics? Well, there are a couple of reasons. Some people will ask, well, why did you choose those particular mics? Well, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, the MKH416 is always, I'm, I bought that microphone to use as a reference for a lot of my microphone comparisons and reviews. So that's why that's in there. It's a common microphone that's been used in the television and film world for many, many years. It's a microphone we've all heard. A lot of people still revere that microphone. <laughs> Some consider it the best microphone ever made. I'm not so sure about that, but it's a good one and uh, that's why we're using it here. Next up is the MTG3. This has been Rode's sort of kind of uh, bread and butter shotgun microphone for many, many years now. It is also an RF bias microphone. And in fact, I should go back and say, the all of these are RF bias except for the Deity S Mic 2S. That's a DC bias condenser microphone. These three are RF bias condenser microphones. So these share the same three principles. That's the Rode NTG3, NTG5, and the Sennheiser MKH 416. Give you a couple moments of silence here. This is my roughly uh, acoustically treated basement. <laughs> I have a sound blanket over on my left, another one on the right, one right behind the camera, a rug underneath me, otherwise uh, concrete floors. I'm sitting in a squeaky wooden chair. That's not squeaking now. Oh, there it goes. A uh, blanket on the floor behind me and then a concrete wall behind us, just so you have a sense for how this room is kind of configured from an acoustical standpoint. So that's a comparison there, just to get a sense for how these different microphones respond. The silence test, by the way, I just want to make a little note about that. That's going to measure a few things. It's a practical noise floor test. It's not a scientific one. We are measuring the sound that's in my room. Plus, uh, part of the factor there is going to be the isolating characteristics of the microphone, how focused its polar pattern is. It's also, it's also going to be the self-noise of the microphone. By the way, I am recording all of this into a sound device's 888 and I have all of them gained, so they're roughly peaking around minus 18 dB full scale. In post, I will have normalized these to minus 23 LUFS. That's what you're hearing. One thing we talked about there was the RF bias versus DC bias condenser microphones. The NTG5 is an RF bias condenser microphone. What does that mean? What are the practical implications? A couple of things. Number one, and probably most importantly, is that if you're going to be working in a very humid environment, a rainforest, for example, or maybe you're in Florida and it's very humid there, or wherever you may be, RF bias microphones have a tendency to be a little bit more resilient to continue working and producing good quality sound in those kinds of circumstances where DC bias microphones can run into issues in those circumstances. Not always, it's not 100% either way, but that's one advantage. RF bias microphones also, because of their design principle, generally have a lower output impedance and you may ask yourself, well, what does that mean? And <laughs> why does it matter? I think in practical terms, the biggest thing that means is that you can use it with pretty much any sort of microphone input with good results for the most part. So this makes it so that you don't have to worry as much about your microphone preamplifier 
as you might with some other microphones that have a higher impedance output. In terms of build, it is made out of all aluminum, which is what contributes to its extraordinarily light weight. So it comes in at only 0.17 pounds, that is 76 grams. In terms of its size, it's 203 millimeters by 19 millimeters or eight inches by three quarters of an inch. And the three quarters of an inch is the diameter, the eight inches is the length. So tiny little microphone, really useful when you're going to be booming it out on the end of a boom pole for an entire day. That can make a difference when you have something that's a little bit lighter. Now, one thing that kind of concerned me when I heard about the NTG5 was I heard that the body itself is made out of aluminum. And I thought to myself, well, I wonder if that means that it's going to be more susceptible to radio frequency interference. That is interference from wireless devices of various sorts. We did some initial testing here, and in our initial testing, we did not find any sort of issues so far. No RF interference incidents yet. <laughs> if that changes at some point here, I'll do an update. Now, one of the reasons you choose a shotgun microphone is because shotgun microphones tend to be a little bit better at focusing which sound they pick up and rejecting the sound that you don't want to pick up. So they have a very focused polar pattern and they are better at rejecting sort of ambient sound that you don't necessarily want to capture. So let's do a couple of things. We're going to do some polar pattern tests, but also first for a real world example, here's some outdoor recordings in a pretty noisy space on a windy day. All right, here's our first outdoor test. Today is a pretty windy day, and Will, what would you say the speed of the wind is today? Five, yeah, five to 10 miles an hour, we're gonna guess here. I am, I've got the mic here, let me just show you. Um, so this is booming pretty typically about uh, within two feet of me right here. And uh, we're recording the NTG5 with the included wind cover, the fur wind cover just to give you a sense for how this is gonna work outdoors when you do have a substantial amount of wind. So, all right, and finally, we have the Rode NTG3 shotgun microphone inside of the Rycoat Cyclone here. Again, about two feet away from me, or within two feet, I should say, maybe between 18 inches and two feet. Recording into a sound device is 888 here. Same location, same wind, same cars behind me, <laughs> same noise. In the parking lot, we have a Suburban our truck driving this way. On our indoor samples here, what we did is we used a Bluetooth speaker and sent white noise to the speaker while we moved it around the microphone on the front and to the back of the mic. And what we did is we measured the difference between the loudness, LUFS, while it's in front of the mic versus the back of the mic to get kind of a rough measure, a very gross measure, if you will, 
of how much rejection each of these microphones does. And you can see here from the numbers that we got a pretty interesting story here. One of the things that you typically look for is longer shotgun microphones traditionally and typically because of the laws of physics are a little bit better at really focusing the polar pattern and rejecting more of the off-axis sound. The very best of them here was a Sennheiser MKH416, which was able to produce a difference of 23.31 loudness units, full scale, difference from the front of the microphone to the back of the microphone, which means that it cuts out the ambiance sound very effectively. The Rode NTG3 was right there with it at 22.59 LUFS, and the Rode NTG5 was not far behind at all at 20. 0.48 LUFS. So now I was surprised by that because the NTG5 is quite a bit shorter. Now it's not exactly as good. It's three loudness units less effective, but it's still incredibly effective for its size. And so that was really impressive to me. We also threw into this test the Deity S Mic 2 and the Deity S Mic 2S just to kind of provide, I guess, a comparison point. And what we found is that the S Mic 2 came in at 17.17 LUFS difference, and the S-Mic 2S at 12.78. Now these two DD microphones don't reject the off-axis sound quite as much, but what they did have going for them, which was quite interesting, is that they also tended to render the off-axis sound pretty naturally. So it almost looks like there's sort of an engineering trade-off there. If you're looking for something that's really good at isolating because you're gonna be working in a noisy environment, you might wanna choose the NTG5, NTG3, or the MKH416. If on the other hand, natural off-axis rendering is more important for your particular application, that's where the Deity microphones may have a little bit of an advantage. If you're an independent filmmaker or YouTuber or something of that nature, and you're working in a space that is just not acoustically treated and is kind of harsh acoustically, then I think isolation might be a more important goal for you. Depends on your situation. When you get into narrative film, that might be a situation where isolation may or may not be as important, and you just have to kind of decide for the situation. If I was gonna choose one as a first mic, I'd probably choose something with a little bit more isolation. And then as I, you know, if I became a production sound mixer, for example, then I might start investing in other microphones, which would give me more options. In combination with the isolation characteristics of these microphones, their ability to kind of isolate the sound you want and reject the sound you don't want, we also want to look at self-noise. Now, combined, the way we did that is that we took the silent portion of each of the audio samples we played earlier, loudness normalized all of the samples to minus 23 LUFS, so the talking parts and the silent part, and then we measured the silent part, and that's where we got these figures here didn't do any sort of other processing. And what we found was that the Rode NTG5 did the best in terms of combining the isolation characteristics and the self noise all together. So that silent section, and I use air quotes there, came in at minus 76.02 dB RMS. That is very impressive, very impressive performance. So that's the combination of its isolating characteristics and its self noise. The Rode NTG3 was right there with it at minus 75.38. And the Sennheiser MKH416 sat at minus 71.57. In this test, we also included the Deity S Mic 2, and that came in at minus 70.63. So all these microphones do well, and the NTG5 seemed to do the best. Handling noise. This is an important factor when you're talking about shotgun microphones that are going to sit out on the end of a boom pole, especially if you're hand booming them. Now, if you're putting them on a static microphone stand, not really a huge deal because you're not generally going to be bumping them. But... If you are handling them, this is a pretty important factor. And what I found here is that with the included shock mount that comes with the NTG5, it does really quite well. It's a Rycote shock mount, and I've used Rycote shock mounts. And this is one of the better ones. There are really inexpensive ones that aren't quite as isolating. Uh, and then there are others that are much better. And this one seems to be kind of on that higher end. It's doing really well in terms of managing handling noise. Now, when I did this booming test here, what I found is the bigger issue is that I'm getting air moving across the microphone capsule, creating this low frequency sound. So that's gonna be a bigger concern than the handling noise itself. And as it happens, the microphone comes with a fur wind cover. So I didn't have that on during the booming test indoors, but if you needed to do some really aggressive cueing like that, like I was doing in the test there, that's when you may wanna use the included fur cover. That fur cover did okay outdoors in the slightest of breezes, maybe the five mile an hour range. But once you start getting into a stiffer breeze, 
you are still going to need a much larger blimp style cover to make sure that you don't get any of that rumbling sound that comes when wind moves across the microphone capsule. As we've mentioned before, it comes with a shock mount and the short cable that allows you to either use it as a pistol grip or to put it on a boom pole. It comes with a pleather pouch, a foam cover, and a fur wind cover. And like most Rode microphones, it comes with an industry-leading 10-year warranty. Now, the biggest questions I'm sure I'm going to hear is, should I upgrade from my current mic? Well, it depends. <laughs> Let's talk first about the Rode NTG3, which incidentally appears to still be in Rode's catalog of microphones. Doesn't look like the NTG5 eliminates the need for the NTG3 in their catalog. I'm not sure what's going to happen long-term, but this is what I can say. If the NTG3 is doing everything you need it to do, you're happy with the performance, there aren't any sort of practical issues that you're having with it, then I don't see a great need to upgrade. However, what I can say is that the NTG5 is definitely lighter weight. It's definitely smaller. So if you are going to be booming all day long, it might be an advantage for you. And it also, to my ear, sounds a little bit more natural. It doesn't have that extended bass response that the NTG3 has. The NTG3 has this very broadcasty sound with a very rich, rich bass bottom end. And that can be something that's totally legitimate. I like the sound. Is it for every situation? No. Is it good in some situations? Absolutely. The NTG5 doesn't extend down quite as far on the frequency range. So to my ear, it generally sounds a little bit more natural, which I think is generally preferable. And then the one thing you do give up if you were to get an NTG5 instead of an NTG3 is you don't get the aluminum storage tube that the NTG3 comes with. Not a big deal. Should you upgrade from other microphones? Well, I think that really comes down to the practical issues you're trying to solve. Now, uh, I think the NTG5 sounds great. Definitely better than a lot of the less than $500 microphones that I have used over the years. So yeah, from that standpoint, I think it's definitely worth an upgrade. If you need something that's lighter because you're booming all day long, yes, the NTG5 could be a great option. Do you need something that's going to work a little bit better in humidity because you've been shooting a lot in humidity and you've been having some problems with some of your DC bias shotgun microphones? Then yeah, it could be a great option there as well. Now, is this microphone perfect? Absolutely not. <laughs> There's no such thing as a perfect product. But there are a couple things that some people may find cons. Let's talk about that really quickly. First of all, there is no self-powering option. There's no inbuilt battery or slot to put a battery into the microphone to self-power it. So if you were planning on putting this on top of your camera, which is really not for your, it's a boom microphone. You should really be booming it over your talent. But if you wanted to put it on your camera, the camera will have to supply phantom power. That means you're gonna need an XLR input on your camera and the camera needs to be able to supply phantom power, 48 volts. Secondly, it does not have an inbuilt high pass filter. That is true of all the microphones we've looked at today. <laughs> the DDS Mic 2, 2S, the NTG3, the Sennheiser MKH416. None of them have high pass filters built in. You can use a high pass filter on your recorder instead. In regards to off axis frequency response, the NTG5 is not probably quite as natural sounding off axis as are the DDS Mic 2 and S Mic 2S. But I think for what you're going for with this microphone, isolation being the number one priority, I think it works pretty nicely. So I don't have any issues with it. It's certainly not any worse than the NTG3 or the Sennheiser MKH416. It is just coloring the off-axis sound a little bit, just so you're aware. Now, in summary, what would I say? If I know what I know now, having used all of these mics plus some others, I would actually say that the NTG5 is probably my favorite $500 USD microphone that I've used so far. And actually, I would say that in the price range $500 to $1,000 USD, if I could only choose one mic, I would choose this one. Even though it's on the lower end of the price scale, I think this is, has a great set of features that work really, really well. It sounds fantastic and just seems like a really great value, especially in light of the fact that it comes with a shock mount that you're going to need anyway. So... Really great deal, great performing microphone. Hope that was helpful for you. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave those down below. And if you've not already subscribed, make sure you do that. And we'll be sure to get you more great videos on how to improve your lighting and sound for video. Talk to you soon.